okay looks like the recording has started uh, well so welcome back uh, today the goal is to talk about the differentiable functions and talk about the second derivative of the function uh, mean value theorem taylor series uh, talk something talk a little bit about matrices and then jump on to convex sets and convex functions so the point where we left off last time was uh, so we have a function from r n to r and the gradient of f evaluated at x was a vector where you take the derivative with respect to the first component you take the derivative with respect to the second component take the derivative with respect to the nth component and then you evaluate it at let's say x bar so then you evaluate it at x bar and we did some um, derivative computation for some functions of two variables and three variables now we want to extend this definition to second derivative of the function so how do we do that let's consider g as a function from rn to rm okay so g of x can be written as g1 of x gm of x where each gi is a function from r n to r now the goal is how should i compute the derivative of g at x bar okay and the convention is i'm going to stack it up like a matrix where i take the derivative of g1 at x bar as the first column then derivative of g2 at x bar as the second column and then the derivative of gm of x bar as the last column okay so this is a matrix in r so it has n rows and it has m columns and that's the convention for taking the derivative of a function that maps r into rm I'm going to pause here so that you can note it down. Okay. Now let's think up think about the second derivative of the function f. So I have gradient of f which is a function from rn to rn um, so what should the second derivative of f look like well it should be the derivative of del f over del x1 all of this will be evaluated at x bar i need to put x bar somewhere so what's the dimension of this matrix n by n n by n right so it has n rows and it has n columns because you are taking the derivative with respect to x1 then x2 and then all the way to xn so it's actually a square matrix perfect i can actually write it more easily by and 
and then so on. Okay, so what's the property of this matrix? Examine it carefully and then uh, try to think about what is an essential property of this particular matrix. It is symmetric. Symmetric, symmetric yeah, great. Uh, it is a symmetric matrix, why? Because if your function is smooth, which is which means that uh, it is infinitely differentiable, um, then what you have is the second derivative of xi xj is actually the same as the second derivative of xj xi. Okay, so this is, this holds when the function f, the second derivative is continuous. And of course, in this class, we are going to assume, you know, the functions are very smooth. So we don't have problems in taking the first, second derivative and so on. So what we actually learned now is that is actually a symmetric matrix. Okay, any questions on that? And this matrix is normally called the Hessian matrix, right? Yes, yes. So, okay. yes, that's right. Sometimes, I mean, in some literature, they call it Hessian. Um, but in, in Bertzeker's book, it's just second derivative. Uh, maybe he also calls it Hessian. I don't recall. Yeah, but it is Hessian. Okay. So now, uh, let's talk about the mean value theorem. Or oh, maybe I should, I should move on to the next page. Okay. So let's say I have a function f from r to r. So it's just a function of one variable and it's a uh, derivative is smooth and everything. So what's the mean value theorem? Well, the mean value theorem says f of y can be written as f of x plus gradient of f of x plus, uh, let's say alpha y minus x multiplied by y minus x. Okay, where alpha is some value between zero and one. So let me draw the picture. This is my function f of x. This is my x. Okay, this is my f of x. This is my f of y. And what mean value theorem says is, if I want to find out, compute the value of f of y, uh, there always exists some alpha between zero and one, so that between x and y, so somewhere between x and y, so let's, let's say this is my 
x plus alpha y minus x. So somewhere between x and y, there is a point. And at that point, if I take the derivative, this is the derivative at this point, uh, multiplied by the difference between the two values, so multiplied by y minus x, add it to the function fx, I get the value of fy. Okay, that's mean value theorem. Um, you can do it for the second order approximation as well. So you could say f of y is equal to f of x plus gradient of f of x y minus x plus one over two factorial Now this alpha is different from this alpha. Let me call this alpha one, call this alpha two. This alpha two is again between zero and one. And this gets multiplied by y minus x square. Okay, so you can have uh, uh, approximation of any order um, in, in the real case, as long as the derivatives exist and are continuous. Um, but but this is of course something you may have studied uh, for functions of one variable. Now it turns out that this expression is actually correct even for functions of multiple variables. So let me write down the expression. F of x plus t can be written as f of x. So f is a function from r n to r. d is a vector in r n. So f of x plus gradient of x plus alpha 1d transpose d and if you want to have a better approx well a approximation using second order term then that would be Okay, so instead of doing y minus x squared that we did here, we now have d transpose second derivative multiplied by d. Okay, so this is the mean value theorem. This is the mean value theorem for functions of multiple variable. This alpha one and alpha two would be between closed interval zero one. Okay, I want you to uh, write it down and think about um, any questions you may have. No questions. Uh, is, um, y minus x. Can you can you say that again? Uh, what is d? Is uh, y minus x? Yes. So d is y minus x. Yes. So in in optimization, we will always think about d as a direction in which we want to go. Uh, so in, it's equal to y minus x. So whether you write uh, y minus x or whether you write this is the d. Um, it's the same, same thing. Is there a difference between the D that you have underlined and a non underlined D? No, no, no. It's the same thing. Uh, I, all I wanted okay. to show was that this is in this case, you have Y minus X squared. In this case, you have D transpose matrix okay. multiplied by D because there is nothing, D, nothing known as D squared uh, for a vector valued for a vector. So it has to be multiplied in a specific way to the matrix. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between the first and the second question? Uh, question uh, oh, so this one is the first derivative uh, multiplied by D. 
uh, this is the second derivative of the function and you have d transpose second derivative multiplied by d. That's the only difference. Yeah, when, when we should we like use the first one and when we should we use the second one? Oh, um, so all of this is useful when you are doing some sort of approximation uh, and depending on how, so let's think about it. If the second derivative is negligible, let's say the, the this particular second derivative seems uh, it's close to zero, uh, then you will of course try to use this particular, you can use the second order expansion and you can argue, well, the third term is actually close to zero. So this is actually the first two terms are the exact expression or close to the exact expression of fx plus t. Um, so it's usually used in approximations and proofs, but otherwise, you know, in terms of algorithmic significance, um, it, it doesn't really matter when you're doing, when you're implementing an algorithm, but it matters when you prove, when you are proving that the algorithm will actually converge to the optimal solution. Uh, can like the second equation be extended more for like for the third order? Yes, or yes, you can. But the third order expression is very, very complicated. So let me, um, now that you brought up this point, I first have to talk about what's the third derivative of this function is. So the third derivative of function would be a three dimensional matrix. I don't know how to show three dimensional matrix. So let me just try. Mm -hmm. It's going to look something like this. Okay, so each term will be the second derivative of del f over del x1, and this will be the second derivative of del f, no. Okay, so it will look something like this. Um, and now when you do the uh, D transpose D, uh, you will actually have three Ds and you will, uh, you will first multiply it in, the, uh, in this direction, then you will multiply it in say this direction and then you will multiply it in this direction with D. Okay, so it's, it's called a tensor product. This is known as tensor product. So tensor is basically a generalization of this inner product of matrices. So, or, or matrix, uh, matrix products. So that's what, uh, it's a much more advanced topic, but yes, you can actually do it even in, even for higher order terms also, as long as the higher order derivatives are smooth. Thank you. Any other question? What exactly does this have to do with the mean? It's called the mean value theorem, but I don't really see the connection with the mean. Uh, you know, actually, I also don't know because ever since I was an undergrad, I've just called it mean value theorem, but I don't know why it's called mean. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I maybe maybe my math professor some explained it, but I, I just don't remember. It was fifteen years ago. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now let's talk about Taylor series now. So I'm sure you would have remembered if F is a function from R to R, then Taylor series basically says I can write f of y as fx plus f prime x y minus x plus one over two factorial f double prime x y minus x square and so on. Right, so this is the Taylor series you may have uh, studied in your calculus class. Um, now again, we can extend it, extend this definition to higher dimensional uh, functions of uh, high dimensional objects. So I'm going to write 
f of x plus t is f x plus gradient f x transpose t plus one over two factorial d transpose higher order terms. Okay. Now, how do you get this expression from the earlier one? Well, you can write, you can define G of alpha. So alpha is in R. You can define G of alpha as F of X plus alpha D. And you can take the Taylor series for alpha. So assuming that the function f is smooth, it will imply that g is also smooth. And you can take g of one equals to g zero plus g prime zero one plus g double prime zero one square over two factorial plus so on. And you can substitute, you can get all the expressions and you will precisely get this Taylor series expansion for functions of multiple variables. Okay, so that's a simple derivation for Taylor series for function f from R into R. Uh, there is a bit of a background noise. Can you check if your mic is on or off? Someone's mic. Imad? Uh, Embad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so any questions on the Taylor series expansion for functions of multiple variables? Okay, so now I'm going to introduce a shorthand notation uh, here, which is small o of norm of d. So small o notation, has anyone seen small o notation before? No. No. Okay. So what is small o notation? So small o of x implies that limit x goes to zero o of x over x is equal to zero. So if x is very small, o of x is uh, very, very small. Okay. Much smaller than x. So for instance, your small o of x is x raised to one plus alpha, or it could be x um, um, what else um thinking so x square log x you know so all of these terms uh, they go to zero as x goes to zero, and so in order instead of writing these terms explicitly, people generally tend to write just o of x because it's very, very small in comparison to rest of the expression. Um, so, so that's the small, o, this is known as the small O notation. It has a big Wikipedia article about O notation. So you can take a look at it, small O notation. O stands for order. So small O of X means that the terms are uh, negligible in comparison to x when x is small. So then I can write the Taylor series expansion as fx, fx transpose t small o norm of t square because now the higher order terms are of the order of d raised to three. 
uh, norm of d raised to three. So I can write it as small o of norm of d square. And so if norm of d square is small, then this term is much, much higher value in comparison to this term. That's why, uh, so it's, it's, again, it's a very good uh, approach in uh, doing numerical analysis and in proving that optimization algorithms converge to uh, an optimal solution or, a, or, or some sort of solution with desired properties. So again, used only in proofs, but it doesn't really is used in the description of the algorithm itself. So it's useful in proof. Okay, I can also write fx plus gradient fx transpose d plus small o norm of d. So if norm of d is small, this term is has a much higher value in comparison to the second derivative term and the third derivative term and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the, just the uh, small o notation, which is typically used in, and we will use it in many of our um, uh, approximations uh, when we talk about gradient descent algorithms and, and so on. Okay, I'm going to pause here for question. Okay, let's talk about another topic, which is chain rule. So you have a function from R to R you have another function from R to R, both of them are differentiable. I can define a third function, which is G composition F. So this is composition, uh, which is basically G of F of X. Okay. Now the question is, what's the derivative of H with respect to X? So what is del H over del X? So can someone recall the chain rule that you may have studied before? What's the expression for this derivative? G of G over G? D uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. Uh, someone else wants to make an attempt? No? no. This is, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah I almost wrote it. So uh, yeah, a differentiation with respect to G then uh, multiplied by F and if uh, G multiplied by differentiation of F. Right, so G prime evaluated at Fx multiplied by F prime evaluated at X. So that's the chain rule. A very useful uh, uh, equation uh, for the undergrad calculus class. Um, so now what's the counterpart for higher dimensional objects? So let's consider the following, my function f is from Rn to Rm. G is a function from Rm to R. So I can define H to be G composition F. And now what's the derivative? So the derivative of H is given by the derivative of F at X multiplied by the derivative of G evaluated at FX. Okay. 
So this is not derivative of G multiplied by the function fx. It is just the derivative of G evaluated at the value f of x. So this is the chain rule. Now let's let's see if it is dimensionally correct or not. So the derivative of f here is actually a vector in R n cross m, as we had discussed uh, just uh, at the beginning of this class, and the derivative of g. Remember, g is a function from R m to R. So the derivative of g is actually a vector in R m, and so I'm multiplying a matrix to a vector. And what I get through this multiplication is R n cross one, or rather R n. So I get a vector in ve vector in R n. And remember, h is a function from R n to R. So this equation is dimensionally correct, and uh, the derivation would would be tedious, but it can be done just by checking that the two sides of this expressions are the same okay so that's the chain rule for differentiation of functions of multiple variables so that's the end of uh, differentiation of functions of multiple variables now i want to jump on to the linear algebra part. You know, I'm I'm quite impressed by OneNote's handwriting recognition. I, I mean, I consider my handwriting to be pretty pathetic, but it still is able to figure out that I've written linear algebra on the top of the page. I'm I'm pretty impressed. Uh, Okay, so there are a few things I want to talk about for matrices. So the first is rank of a matrix. So A is in R n cross M. So the rank of A is equal to number of linearly independent rows which turns out to also be same as the number of linearly independent columns okay that's known as the rank of a matrix so matrix is full rank it means that all its rows are linearly independent or all its columns are linearly independent well, I shouldn't say all, I should say the minimum of N or M. So let's assume that N is, N is less than M. Then a matrix is full rank if uh, all the rows are linearly independent. So that's full rank. Full rank matrix is defined as rank a equals to minimum of m comma n okay so wherever you have a matrix with a lower rank then it must have a non trivial null space okay so in this class we are going to talk extensively about symmetric matrices so matrix a in r n cross n is symmetric if a equals to a transpose Okay, and I'm going to state some facts which are not difficult to prove, but um, but it 
it, it must have been proved in your linear algebra class. So the first fact is that the eigenvalues, oh, I haven't talked about eigenvalues. Uh, let's talk about eigenvalues first. Square matrices. So you have A is a square matrix, Rn cross N. I take determinant A minus lambda. I, I here is the identity matrix of the dimension N. And I set it equal to zero. Uh, this is a known as characteristic polynomial. And it's of degree n. So all polynomials of degree n have roots in the complex plane. So the roots of characteristic polynomial are called eigenvalues. Okay. Now that is for corresponding to every eigenvalue, you can have a eigenvector. So a v equals to lambda v. This is so v is known as the eigenvector. And lambda is the eigenvalue and this lambda satisfies determinant of a minus lambda equals to zero. Okay, so lambda is the eigenvalue, V is the eigenvector of A, matrix A. So you will have N eigenvalues and you will have corresponding eigenvectors. Uh, most of the times, I mean, not most of the times, but in a lot of matrices, um, uh, there are some complications because of which you cannot find N linearly independent eigenvectors for, for uh, N eigenvalues. So. Uh, so it leads to some complications and you have to go through Jordan canonical form and all that stuff. But we are not going to concern ourselves with those issues. You probably would hear about it in either EC5551 or in the linear systems class, which is EC6754. So we are not going to concern about, uh, we will not be concerned about those Jordan canonical form stuff. So let's just assume that in our case, we have n linearly independent eigenvectors. So I'm going to assume we have n linearly independent eigenvectors for the purpose of discussion. Any questions so far? I think these are all easy stuff that you may have seen earlier. Okay, so let me stack u as the eigenvector. So v1, vn, these are the n linearly independent eigenvectors. So u becomes a invertible matrix because it's a full rank matrix. Full rank invertible and we have the following expression a u equals to u d where d is diagonal matrix with lambda one to lambda n as its diagonal entries and u of course is this matrix okay so let's let's see why so i have a V1 to Vn equals to AV1, AVn 
equals to lambda one b one lambda n v n which is equal to u multiplied by t okay so a u equals to u d this is the expression we have and what that would imply so you get two two expressions for free from here one is a equals to u d u inverse and the second is d equals to u inverse a u and d is a diagonal matrix okay so this means that a is because you can find the matrix u such that u inverse a u is diagonal it implies that a is diagonalizable so this is known as a is diagonalizable okay any question so far uh i have a question yes go ahead uh what is exactly the meaning of diagonal diagonalizable so so you can find a matrix u such that u inverse a u is a diagonal matrix remember d is a diagonal matrix here right d is uh yeah. has eigen values of a in as yeah. diagonal entries so u inverse a u actually has a diagonal structure and that means that a right. is diagonalizable that's just the definition right okay okay yeah. thank you um, uh, excuse me what is v b is a uh, a diagonal matrix with the diagonal entries as the eigen values of matrix a no 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 i mean uh, what is v but like u is v1 to vn oh v v is a uh, v is the eigen vector um uh, remember this expression av equals to lambda v oh yeah uh, sorry i must have missed it so yeah. okay so let's uh, let's go over it once more so i have a square matrix i can compute the eigen values and eigen vectors of that matrix i can stack all the eigen vectors as a matrix u uh, assuming that all eigen vectors are linearly independent what we get is a full rank matrix um, when you have a full rank matrix then you can invert it and that leads us to the expression that a equals to u d u inverse and d equals to u inverse a u okay um so let's let's jump now to symmetric matrices so in symmetric matrices the of course the idea is a equals to a transpose and this leads to several facts the first fact is lambda 1 to lambda n are real numbers the second fact is v1 to vn are mutually orthogonal vectors uh the proofs of all these all these things are very easy but i won't cover it in this class uh because it will unnecessarily delay everything uh what else the third is 
u inverse equals to u transpose so the the set of so because the eigenvectors are mutually orthogonal u inverse is actually equal to u transpose and this would imply that u u transpose equals to u transpose u equals to i okay so set of eigenvectors actually have very beautiful property here Oh, I'm going to assume that whenever I talk about eigenvectors, I'm just going to assume that the norm of B i is equal to one. This is the two norm. So I'm just going to uh, scale all the eigenvectors such that they are of unit norm. Okay, so this is a beautiful property shared by all symmetric matrices. And the symmetric matrix that we will most concern ourselves with are called positive definite matrices. So A is positive definite if A equals to A transpose and lambda one to lambda N is greater than zero. Okay, then there are positive semi-definite matrices. Which is A equals to A transpose lambda one to lambda N greater than equal to zero. And then you have negative definite and then negative semi-definite. Okay, so in this case, again, we have A equals to A transpose, but lambda one to lambda N is strictly less than zero. Lambda one to lambda N is less than equal to zero. And of course, A equals to A transpose. So these are all symmetric matrices. Any questions so far on symmetric matrices or positive definite matrices? Can you have a positive definite matrix that is not symmetric? Uh, no, that's just the definition. So you, I mean, a, only a symmetric matrix can be a positive definite matrix. Okay. Yeah. So it's just by definition. So you, you can have matrices which have positive eigenvalues. So all eigenvalues are positive real numbers, but they need not be symmetric and therefore they are not positive definite matrix. Okay. Yeah. Because the other definition I've seen for positive definite is um, like if you have a, a vector X and then yeah. you have X transpose a X is right. greater than zero. Right. Um, but that definition doesn't necessarily show. So the two uh, definitions are equivalent. Doesn't? Let me write it. Okay. Here. Lemma x transpose ax greater than zero so asymmetric a equals to a transpose let me write it a equals to a transpose then x transpose ax greater than zero for all x not equal to zero if and only if um, lambda one to lambda n is greater than zero for a okay same thing uh, x transpose ax is greater than or equal to zero for all x not equal to zero if and only if lambda one to lambda n is greater than or equal to zero so these are all equivalent definitions
So how would I go about proving, let's say I want to prove this result. How would I go about proving this result? Uh, let me just show you a, a very simple argument. So I have X and I know that V1 to Vn are mutually orthogonal. So I can write X as alpha one V1 plus alpha N Vn for some real numbers, alpha one to alpha N. Um, yeah, for some real numbers, alpha one to alpha N. Um, now, if I evaluate X transpose AX, well, let me just evaluate AX first. Alpha one AV one plus alpha N AVN, which is equal to alpha one lambda one B one, alpha N lambda N VN. And then I just uh, transpose it with X So I have alpha one B one plus alpha N B N transpose. Okay. And now you can do the math and show that this is actually strictly positive. Assuming X is not equal to zero. And the reason for that is because V1 transpose V2 will be equal to zero. V2 transpose V3 will be equal to zero. V2 transpose V1 will be equal to zero. So a lot of terms will cancel out. And actually this will be equal to alpha one square, lambda two alpha two square plus lambda and alpha n square, which is strictly positive. So because each of these lambdas are strictly positive and at least one of these alphas have to be non-zero because the original vector X itself is non-zero and V1 to Vn are linearly independent. So, so that's why this, the, the two definitions of positive definiteness are equivalent. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, uh, we have just two minutes, so I want to cover another definition. So I know I went over this pretty quickly, but, uh, but it's not central to our uh, course right now. It's just some background stuff, so you can review it later uh, if you don't recall them from your previous class. So I want to define spectral radius. So, the spectral radius is denoted by rho of A, and this is equal to the maximum of absolute value of all eigenvalues of A, okay? So you have, this is the complex plane. This is the complex plane, real line, imaginary line, and then you have this bunch of eigenvalues, and you draw a unit circle, Oh, not the unit circle. Um, you draw the circle so that all the eigenvalues are within that circle. So let me draw it this way. Okay, so at least one eigenvalue lies on the radius of the circle and all other, on the uh, perimeter of the circle and all other eigenvalues are inside the circle. Uh, then this radius is known as spectral radius of the matrix A. This is the spectral radius. Okay. And one of the things we will talk about eventually is that if spectral radius of A is less than one, then this implies that XK plus one equals to AXK plus B. So this iteration converges to some X star. Uh, and it, it will turn out that this particular idea is extremely powerful within the uh, optimization class. And we will, we will get to this particular equation perhaps around lecture 20 or lecture 21, where we talk about Banach contraction mapping theorem, where we will formally show that this result actually holds. Okay, so 
Um, so that's where the spectral radius will be used uh, eventually. Let me just write it as theorem. Uh, okay, so I wasn't able to cover convex sets and convex functions, so I'm going to do that in the next class. And then we will jump directly into the optimization theory uh, for unconstrained optimization. Um, so with that, I end this class. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'll still stick around, but if you want to drop off the class, that's completely fine. What What is the that last equation? You have x of k, and then what yeah. is the other subscript? x k plus one equals to a x k plus b. So this is an iteration. So I have a vector x k. I multiply it by a add b. I get x k plus one, and then repeat this operation again and again. Any other question? Okay, perfect. Uh, Professor, so see you on. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so uh, when you uh, towards the end of uh, mean value theorem, I just have a yes, of doubt. course. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, you're, you're evaluating a uh, gradient of hx, and then the last part is uh, gradient of fx, uh, and then it gets multiplied by gradient of g evaluated at f of x. I just want to clear it up. Oh, the mean. Okay, so you mean the uh, chain I mean, rule, not the mean. Yeah, the chain rule. Yeah, like to yeah. in the in the lecture. Yes, part. yes. So this is gradient of f x. It's a matrix, and it gets multiplied to the gradient of g. But you have to evaluate the gradient of g. Gradient of g is an expression. You have to evaluate it at a point. Okay. And that point is f of x. Okay, on the whole. Okay. Yeah, yeah. understood. So remember, f of x is a point in R M, right? And yes. Yeah, and that's where you evaluate the gradient of G at. Yeah, thank you, sir. Okay. Any On that question? last equation, what yeah. is X star? Is that the minimum? Uh, here? Yeah. Yeah, no, this is, uh, all I'm saying is that this is going to converge to some X star. Let me just write it as X bar if it makes. So, do, so okay. X star is just some point in the space or X bar is just some point in the space. It'll turn out, it'll turn out that this X bar is actually equal to I minus A inverse B. Okay. Any other question? Okay. All right. Thank you. And I'll see you guys on Wednesday.